Hi, my name is Angie DeVore, and I am the Cone Beam Imaging Coordinator at IUSD. I am a radiologic technologist, and I have been for about 25 years. And so, very briefly this morning, we're going to talk about some very basic fundamentals of cone beam imaging. This is an ICAP machine, and it's actually very brand new. We just got it not even three weeks ago. And so, the outside of it is very similar to the machine that I ran previously, which was the same manufacturer, but the inside components, the software components, are magnificent. It's so much easier to run. Um, a lot of guesswork has been taken out on how to operate this type of equipment. Speaking on um, cone beams in general, there are three different types in the school, and they all run differently. So it's not like a pano machine where you know one pano, you know all panos, or if you know one intraoral uh, x-ray tube, you know them all. These machines are manufacturer specific, and so each one, each person that runs each machine will need the training on how that specific machine works. The ones that are in endodontic department are meant for a quadrant, I like to say, and so that machine will encircle individual teeth, whereas my machine and the machine up in the orthodontic department will do full arches or a full face. I believe that the endodontic machine is a fixed field of view, and the orthodontic machine is also a fixed field of view. With this machine, the field of view can vary as to the anatomy that you need. So I can open up a field of view so it's the entire length of the face, so that's a full face scan. Or I can turn the, the field of view to an orientation like this and get more of an individual arches. But I can't do just a few specific teeth. The thing about radiology, and I've seen it happen, is if you give it five to seven years, there will be a manufacturer that comes up with one machine that does it all. So for right now, I have this skull set up uh, for a mandible scan, and my crosshairs are on this side, which is why my controls are here. I could raise the chair up and down, but for purpose of the demonstration, that doesn't move the skull because it's on a platform. If you imagine a patient sitting here and I had to move them up into the field of view or down into the field of view, that's where the movement of the chair happens. But it is about getting that patient into the specified field of view that you've already chosen on the software. This machine also gives a scout um, image. <clears throat> and what that is meant to do is you know exactly where you're scanning before you hit the button to make that 26.9 second scan. All of the scans that I do on this new machine are that length of time. The longer that the scan is on, here comes some nerdy science, okay? The longer that your scan is on, the more x-ray photons are being produced at the target of your, of your x-ray tube. So therefore, the mo more x-ray photons are coming out, more x-ray photons are interacting with the anatomy of the patient, and then more x-ray photons are exiting the patient and, go and being um, captured by the volume center. So if you have a scan that's only seven seconds long, versus a scan that's 25 seconds long, the 25 second scan is going to resolve better. It's going to show better resolution, sharpness of detail, uh, cortical bone versus trabecular bone. A seven second scan is more meant for a quick shot identification of maybe where a tooth is not the kind of resolution that is needed for implant placement, and certainly not the kind of resolution that is needed for orthognactic surgery workups, which are the lion's share of the patients that I do. So 
We have the guy set up for a mandible scan. X marks the spot as far as where the crosshair goes. Um, the patient would have had the lead put on them prior to having a seat. And then if a patient's feet begin to dangle off of the ground as I bring the patient up, then we use this footstool in order to maintain the patient's body stability. Because we want this scan one time. And if the scan has motion in it because we failed to put the patient in a proper body position or we failed to give the patient proper instructions to hold still, motion is blurry and blurry is repeat and repeat is more radiation. So I, I try everything I can to do my scans just the one time. There are other extraneous factors where patients have involuntary motion and you, you can't help that. All of that needs to be documented so the doctor is aware that you took the best images that you could with the patient at that time. Okay, I'm going to go over to the software and set up the machine to take the first scalp image and then I'll show you what that looks like. And then we'll put the field of view where it needs to be and then we'll do the scan itself. So this is the software for the iCAT scanner and it is mouse driven like most computers are but it's also touch screen. So I have specific fields of view set up for the anatomy with which I image the most of and this mandible scan is set up for the 26.9 second at 0.2 voxels your voxel determines the amount of resolution. So what you need to remember is the smaller a voxel size is, the better resolution that you have. The smaller a voxel size is, the more images are being taken. So a machine can shoot at a 0.4 voxel versus a 0.2 voxel and with a 0.2 voxel, they're taking double the amount of images. So I have it chosen for this mandible scan. And I'm going to, as the trainer, the trainer kept saying, push it forward. So that's putting the arrow to go to the next step to the next step. Now we're set up for a scout. And that's the first image that gives us the field of view to allow us to get the proper anatomy on the scan that the doctor has ordered. It said it was positioning the scanner. It says to drag the field of view to reposition the gantry. Not going to do that until I see the initial scout image so I know where to drag the field of view to. So push it forward. Now it's preparing for the scan. Then it will tell me when it is ready. Then I will go outside of my room because I can only initiate the x-ray from outside of the room for obvious radiation safety guidelines. So this is our first scout image that I just took. And as you can see, we have what looks to be a lateral or side view of the mandible. And so, again, I could use the mouse to move my field of view, or I can use my finger. And so, I obviously don't need this area on there. So we're going to use what we have to bring the field of view up to capture as much anatomy as is seen. Something else that's very important about tomography is that there will always be one point that's in focus. That's the axis with which the x-ray tube rotates around the patient. And so it's very important to have that focal point exactly in the center of the anatomy that you want. And what I mean by that is I could move this field of view way out here, and now this part of the area will be the most in focus. And then let's say if they wanted to be looking at the TMJs as well, your TMJs are not going to be as 
much in focus because they are that far away from the focal point. So to fix that, you simply move this back to capture that anatomy as such. So now this entire mandible, well actually I'm going to go a little bit more right there because I'm a perfectionist, or at least I try to be. So now all the anatomy that you see there will be captured on the scan and that which where the focal point is will be the most in focus. These um, anterior teeth here, you'll still be able to see them with really good resolution because the machine just shoots really well. And we'll also be able to see the TMJs with equal resolution even though they are technically further away from um, the focal point. So my scout image now has the field of view on it that is needed. Um, that was ordered by the dentist. Radiation is like medication. I cannot dispense it without a prescription, so I need a doctor's order. I need the doctor's referral. So pushing that forward, now it's preparing for the scan itself. I tell several things to the patient, um, especially along the lines of how the machine is going to revolve around them and then go back to start. I'm conf constantly emphasizing the importance to hold still. So as you can see, we are ready to take the scan for the 29, uh, 26.9 seconds that the machine will be on and that's the time frame that it will be revolving around the patient. So now, I just took about 400 images of the mandible and the system is reconstructing those into the axial, the coronal, and the sagittal images that make up the three dimensions of the patient, that make up why this is known as 3D um, dental CT. And so, as quickly as that, it has produced a volume of the mandible, and then this is our axial image. Now I'm gonna go back to um, using my mouse at this point. I usually only use the touch screen to move the um, field of view around. I mean, I could use the, my finger here, but just as far as looking at the anatomy, I feel as though I get a little bit better control of what I'm looking at when I grab the mouse and go a little bit more slowly. So we're seeing this axial image is the patient is shall we say sliced into top and bottom halves and so this is from top to bottom as you can see here going that would be their uh, maxilla right about there and then there's some of their teeth and then coming on down through the mandible definitely have all of the mandible on there. If I was imaging this patient for a maxilla scan, I would have positioned higher, so I would have all of the sinuses on there. It's important for them when we're doing implants to know where the sinuses lie in relation to the um, maxilla. We can also see a coronal image now in addition. So these lines now correspond with each other. So coronally, if I pull this one, now I'm going to start to see this patient from, coronal slices are from uh, front to back. So teeth, and then going, there's would be their TMJs right about there. Oh, wait, I'm sorry. TMJs are right there, there and there. That was just part of the um, mandible. 
And then sagittally is the side view. So sagittally are slices from right to left. Let's start over here. And we can drag this across and see the side images of these teeth. And then one more time, as you can see how the lines correspond. Let's go back to this one. We would be right there on their maxilla, and we could be able to see that coronally and axially as these lines um, correspond with each other. From this point, these DICOM images are pushed forward sent out of the scanner into another um, archive. From that archive, I upload them to my packs and I save them on the shared drive that is part of my department in the Department of Oral Pathology, um, Medicine and Radiology. That is technically who I belong to. Uh, in this school. So we would be, if we had another patient we wanted to do, we would hit new scan and it would ask us, are you sure you want to close this, this exam and select a new patient? Because let's pretend that I had other things I wanted to do on the patient. I could say no, go back. I could hit same exam and I could scan the same patient, this video patient, another time. If they wanted something else, or if um, the anatomy wasn't on there. But again, I try very hard to get everything that is needed on the patient scan the first time around. So I'm going to say exit this patient. And now I'm back to uh, the main screen that lists the patients that I need to do. The average patient exam in this room takes anywhere from 10 to 15 minutes. Oftentimes, I have to put retraction into a patient's mouth to bring their lips and their cheeks out away from their teeth. On a CAT scan, the soft tissue of the, the patient's cheek and the lips look exactly like their gums. So in order to tell where the gum end and the cheeks begin, we bring the cheeks out of the way of the scan. Um, very important when they're beginning to plan the implant so they know what's what inside the mouth. If anyone has any other questions that really haven't been covered by the video, I would certainly welcome those. I'm in S125, um, seated in the oral surgery area. Um, very busy in this office, but don't be afraid to knock on the door and come in and, and ask whatever is st you're still wondering about. Because it might be a, um, something I don't know about the equipment, and I would love to seek the knowledge as well.